Over the past half century, more than 66 billion trees have been planted across some of the harshest landscapes on Earth, transforming over 500,000 square kilometers, an area roughly the size of Spain, from uninhabitable desert into living ecological belts. This has been a national-level campaign of extraordinary ambition, pushing the limits of how extreme environments can be converted into landscapes capable of sustaining life to a degree unprecedented in modern history. Yet reality remains far more unforgiving. Millions of hectares of desert still persist, and experience has shown that planting trees alone is not enough. Yet then, there is the Miu Us Desert, where the Chinese undertook something that appears almost irrational, planting thousands of young saplings directly into sand without artificial irrigation. What followed forced scientists, policymakers, and the world itself to reconsider the true limits of human capability in the face of the desert. So what happened in Muas, and what was the price that had to be paid? China's fight against desertification is often told as a story of victory. The desert advanced, humans intervened, the desert retreated. But this narrative overlooks the scale of the threat that made such intervention unavoidable in the first place. By the end of the 20th century, more than a quarter of China's land was classified as desertified or at risk, advancing by thousands of square kilometers each year. Dust storms swept into major cities. Farmland disappeared. Vast regions stood on the edge of ecological collapse. What followed was not an environmental experiment, but a national response to an existential risk. The question, therefore, is no longer whether intervention was necessary. That much is clear. Desertification is not simply the absence of vegetation, but the breakdown of an entire system. Soils lose their ability to retain water, wind amplifies erosion, and natural feedback loops are reversed. When this happens, a landscape can appear green again without truly being restored. In Moose, the current stability is not the end of desertification, but a fragile pause, one in which, if ecological balances are disrupted, the desert could return faster and with greater intensity than before. The Muwes Desert, often called Moose, lies on the Ordos Plateau, stretching across Inner Mongolia and Northern Shanxi. Historical records, pollen data, and sediment layers suggest that this region was once semi-arid but stable. Grasslands dominated, rivers and seasonal wetlands supported both wildlife and human settlement. The collapse did not happen overnight. It unfolded over centuries, accelerating in the modern era. Deforestation removed wind barriers. Overgrazing stripped vegetation faster than it could regenerate. Agriculture expanded beyond ecological limits. As plant cover disappeared, wind erosion intensified, lifting topsoil into the atmosphere and exposing infertile sublayers beneath. By the mid-20th century, the system crossed a threshold. Sand dunes became mobile. Water tables dropped, dust storms intensified. Cities like Yulin were forced to relocate multiple times as sand buried homes and infrastructure. Entire villages vanished under moving dunes. This matters because deserts formed through systemic collapse do not reverse easily. Once feedback loops are established, wind erosion, soil loss, water depletion, simply adding trees does not automatically restore balance. China's response did not begin with science. It began with organized desperation. In the early years, saplings were carried into the desert and planted almost blindly into open sand. Pits were filled in by wind within hours. Roots dried out before they could anchor. Survival rates were so low that failure was not a risk. It was the expectation. Season after season, millions of trees died, buried, uprooted, or burned by heat within weeks of planting. Yet the planting continued. At this scale, failure was not a reason to stop. It was treated as data. 
Every dead tree marked a boundary of what could not work. By the early 1990s, the strategy reversed. Rather than confronting the desert head-on with trees, planners shifted focus to a more basic task, slowing the movement of sand itself. Grasses were introduced before forests, low-growing, resilient species capable of binding sand and weakening wind at ground level. Across moving dunes, millions of straw checkerboard grids were laid down like rough stitches across an open wound. They did not remove the sand. They merely stopped it from moving. Wind velocity dropped near the surface. Moisture lingered for hours longer than days. For the first time in decades, the sand remained still long enough for life to attempt a return. With surface movement restrained, the real battle shifted underground. Soil hydrodynamics became the decisive front. Researchers realized the core problem was not how many trees were planted, but how their root systems competed for the same scarce water. Root depth was recalculated. Spacing between plants was increased to prevent multiple trees from drawing from a single groundwater pocket. Soil structure was modified to reduce evaporation, preserving thin layers of moisture between cycles of heat and wind. Species were selected not for rapid growth or visual density, but for their ability to endure multi-year drought cycles without collapse. These adjustments were subtle, almost invisible, but they compounded. By the early 2000s, survival rates, once unthinkable, exceeded 80% in certain zones. Forest belts expanded, sandstorms that once engulfed cities weakened or disappeared. From an engineering perspective, the system worked. For a brief moment, it seemed as if everything was over. Satellite images showed an unbroken band of green, winds slowed, sandstorms disappeared. On paper, the system had succeeded. Then the dry years arrived. No catastrophe, no headlines. Rainfall dropped just enough to matter. But underground, the balance began to slip. Groundwater recharge slowed. Trees that had survived for years began to weaken. The signs were hard to see. To outsiders, the forest still stood. Researchers understood. The system had reached its limit. Every new hectare of green increased water demand. The desert no longer failed through sandstorms. Quietly, it failed through hydrology. In Moose, success no longer meant moving forward. It meant avoiding collapse. It was at this moment of apparent success that a deeper contradiction emerged. The landscape was stable, but not free. What existed was not a self-sustaining ecosystem but a carefully designed and continuously managed system. Technical success had been achieved. Ecological independence, the ability of the system to persist without constant human intervention, remained unresolved. Across the world, humans have attempted similar interventions with mixed results. In Africa's Sahel region, the Great Green Wall was designed to halt desertification through a restored land corridor stretching across the continent. Despite decades of effort, progress has remained uneven. Political instability, funding shortages, and water scarcity have constrained long-term success. Israel took a different path. Rather than greening the desert at scale, it optimized water use. Precision irrigation, wastewater recycling, and crop selection allowed agriculture to exist without attempting to transform the entire landscape. Productivity increased, but the desert remained a desert. In the United States, the lesson came earlier and in a more painful form. After the Dust Bowl of the 1930s, the federal government launched the Great Plains Shelter Belt Project, planting more than 200 million trees as windbreaks stretching from Texas to North Dakota.
The project reduced soil erosion and dust storms for decades. But as subsidies declined, land returned to private ownership, and agricultural pressure intensified. Many shelter belts were removed or deteriorated. When centralized management weakened, the system quickly lost its capacity to withstand stress. Moose is different, not because deserts in China operate differently, but because governance capacity is different. The ability to mobilize labor, enforce land use restrictions, subsidize long-term maintenance, and absorb ecological risk is rare. The lesson here is uncomfortable. China's success in combating desertification may depend less on ecological science and more on whether a political system can stand outside market logic and electoral cycles long enough to sustain intervention. How do you assess this claim? Share your perspective in the comments below. The positive impacts are measurable and significant. Forest coverage in some regions increased from under 2% in the 1950s to over 30% by 2020. Sandstorm days dropped from more than 100 per year to fewer than 10. Agricultural yields increased nearly tenfold. Household incomes rose from subsistence levels to tens of thousands of yuan annually. Cities stabilized. Infrastructure survived. Migration slowed. But beneath these gains lie new dependencies. Many restored areas rely on monoculture tree species, limiting biodiversity and increasing vulnerability to disease. Increased vegetation alters groundwater dynamics, sometimes depleting aquifers elsewhere. Changes in rainfall patterns benefited some crops while harming others. The system became productive, but also more tightly coupled to human management. Remove the maintenance, and the balance begins to unravel. What satellite images largely fail to show is water. Every tree that survives in moose operates within a strictly limited water budget. Even without irrigation, vegetation draws moisture from soils and shallow aquifers, meaning total water demand rises as green cover expands. The paradox is that restoration's success alters the very hydrological balance that allowed it to begin. In semi-arid systems, groundwater recharge is slow. Just a few dry years can erase decades of gradual recovery. The system does not collapse suddenly. It weakens over time, often unnoticed until it is too late. In moose, restoration is therefore not a reversal of desert conditions, but a continuous negotiation with water. When that balance shifts, even slightly, the desert does not need to advance aggressively. It only requires humans to misjudge how fragile the system has become. Muse reveals an uncomfortable truth. Green does not always mean recovery. Satellite images can show forests, but they cannot show what matters most, whether an ecosystem can stand on its own. A child who grows up independent does not need to be held forever. A forest is no different. Only when it can support itself has it truly recovered. And a desert that stops moving has not necessarily lost the forces that drive its destruction. In Moose, humans did not eliminate the forces behind desertification. They merely held them in check. The wind is still there. The soil remains poor. Water is still scarce. What changed was the presence of a management system strong enough to constantly adjust, correct, and prevent the landscape from slipping past a critical threshold. This is the structural vulnerability of engineered ecosystems. They can withstand natural forces, but they are fragile in the face of human disengagement. Moose shows not only what humans are capable of building, but also what cannot be allowed to be abandoned. The green line holds until it doesn't. From orbit, the Moose Desert looks conquered, but deserts do not surrender, they wait. Beneath every stabilized dune lies sand that remembers how to move. Beneath every tree lies a water balance that can shift. China has shown what is possible when human systems are aligned at scale. 
But the future of moose depends not on trees alone, but on whether this green line can be maintained for generations. The final question is not whether humans can turn deserts green. It is whether they can afford to keep them that way.